Hey, I'm Pastor Todd Hoskins, and I want to say thank you for viewing some of our clips from recent services and years past on our Redemption Christian Tabernacles YouTube page. We encourage you also to go to Facebook where you find us there live every single service, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. In the meantime, view some of the clips. I pray the preaching will be a blessing to you from right here inside a Redemption Christian Tabernacle. As we look in the Word of God, John the Baptist stated it so eloquently well, but yet so simplistic in John 3 and verse number 30. He said this, he must increase. But when he talked about the goodness of God, he followed that up with a real simple statement, but I must decrease. He certainly said it so profoundly well when he knew the responsibility that he had some work to do. There was some things he had to be intentional about. There's some stuff he knew he had to cut out of his life. There's some stuff that had to become a sacrifice. There were things he had to walk away from. There were things he wasn't going to get for the sake of getting more of God. And so the fact is in John 3.30, what powerful statement that is. He must increase, but I must decrease. Everybody say that. God, increase on the inside of me. God, increase on the inside of me. Because God has a way when he develops you. You feel that overwhelming power of his presence. And anything that God gets in and you allow him free will and reign in your life, he's going to push everything out that is not needed. He's got a great way of showing up and sickness has to go. He has a great way of showing up and death has to leave. He's got a great way of showing up and infection has to be cast out. He's got a great way of showing up and demons have to go. Because we speak the name of Jesus and devils tremble because they believe. Here we find in Judges chapter 7, they're at the well of Herod, which means a place of trembling. Chapter number 6 and verse 13, uh, the Bible speaks the question, if the Lord is with us, why hath all this befallen us? And we have asked multiple times, no doubt in our life, if I'm where God wants me to be, if I'm doing what God wants me to do, why is this happening to me? I'm certain no one in here has ever asked that question, but if we'll all be truthful, we would probably all raise our hands. I'm not trying to be delicate as I tread through this area, but I want you to understand God knows at times you have questions about life and why does life treat me this way and why has it happened this way and I'm doing what God wants me to do. Why have I gone through such a difficult season here? There's some of you that are asking the question on live stream to television to radio to those of you that are sitting under the sound of my voice right now. Why have I had to go through that? You understand that Promotion comes, and the premise of it is based upon the fact that there is a cutting away. There is a time of affliction. There are things that you might go through, and it is always the thermometer to knowing the gauge and the forecast of your life is going to go through difficult times that you don't understand. Whenever you're going through difficult times, you better understand the difficulty will equal the blessing. The difficult leaves, but the blessing is going to stay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let me transition a little bit and just say this, that if I've learned anything in my life, it's this. You have to have the right people around you. Not just people, but their voices. Not just their voices, but the influence the voice brings. You have to get around people that have the right influence. I have been, I can't tell you the amount of times in hospitals in dire circumstances where they literally told us to protect my spouse I had to tell a nurse, don't talk that way in front of my husband. I had to tell a doctor, don't put it that way. We know that God can heal. And I've watched time after time after time in the face of adversity and to their face three days and four days later, I told you God was going to move. And we don't speak that way because I don't want them to receive that negative report. I have to preach what I feel today. There's nothing worse in life than bringing the wrong person, the wrong influence. And there's nothing better when the proper personnel gets there. And they show up and they help you through counsel. And they help you by the Spirit of the Lord and the presence of God to help you migrate to the places that God would have cut out for you for such a time as the season that you might be walking into. I ask you to ask the mariners about Jonah that was in their boat. Ask them 
how tumultuous it is to have the wrong person in your vessel, to have the wrong person in your life, and to throw out your belongings and to throw out most of what you're going to feast on so that you can even survive for the following week. And you see everything that was on the boat floating off in the distance because you've got a Jonah that's in the bottom of the boat. The worst thing in life you ever want is to bring somebody into your life that's not cut out to be there. They were carrying a Jonah. They threw him back but not before losing lots of belongings. And they find out the minute they throw him back, everything is better when you extract the thing in your life that's not to be there. The influence is there. The people that are there that are holding you down. Can I keep on preaching? There has got to be in this house a ship master. There has got to be someone in here that knows better when you have the right people in your boat or not. And I'm trying to be so careful as I preach this, but let me just keep making my way into what I feel like that God wants me to say. Those that are afraid need to leave. As we transition into Judges chapter 7, you can go back to the book of Deuteronomy and there is a law of warfare that you are not to go. And there's reasons, reasons, reasons. And then we get to the place where it says there are reasons. If a man is fearful and afraid, tell him not even to come to the battle. Just go on and stay home. We do not want to bother with people that are not ready to battle. We will find multitudes of groups coming up. And the first group you need to eject is people that are afraid of where you're going. Because people that are... I think sometimes we need to let go of people that we're trying to drag, afraid of where we're going that do not want to go where we're going. You, you need to understand they are holding you back. They are creating lag in your flight. You need to just turn loose of some people and say, sorry, baby, I got somewhere God wants me to go and I got to go. If someone is afraid to go where you're going, you need to cut them loose and terminate it early. Early enough that they don't hold you up another week and they don't hold you up another two weeks. I cannot stand to be around people that are never optimistic. People that always want to drag you back to 1982. I'm not interested in the defeats of everything that they've gone through as it relates to I know I heard from God and I know that God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all we ask or think. Can I just find some people that are not afraid to get up and do something for the Lord? Can I find some people not afraid to tell the truth? Can I find some people not afraid to confront their giants? Can I find some people that are not afraid to believe that God is able to heal and set free and deliver? Run them out of the room and get some people around you that are not afraid. Set them loose. Cut them free. You got to find you some people that believe in the God that's within you and to believe the God that's blessing you and keeping you. And so first and foremost, those that are afraid, go home. We're going to do this without you. You're just going to get in the way. You're just going to drag us down. Stop being negative. Stop being so pessimistic. Stop being so there's no way around that. You're going to stunt growth. You're going to keep people from their full potential. Stop knocking people down. Stop calling your kids brats and rugrats. Stop telling them they're not smart, that they're dumb, that they're ignorant. Stop it in the name of Jesus. Stop cutting the neighborhood kids down. Stop cutting the church kids down. Stop cutting family down. Start speaking life over them. And as you speak life over them, pray for them. Pray for them that God will turn it around. Daddies, hold on to your babies. Mama, comfort those babies. Get in this together and let's see God do some great things. Pastors, love on the people. Encourage the people. Push on the people. Challenge the people. Get a vision. Set some goals. 
Know that God is going to take care of it, and he will. There's another group of people. There's another group of people after 22,000 walked away. Gideon's turning around thinking, okay, 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 we got 10,000. And all of a sudden, the Lord steps in and says, I got one more test for you. I want you to see how they respond by the creek, by the spring, by the water. I want you to see how they do. And those that lap like a dog, I want you to leave them there. But those that scoop it up and those that drink differently and watch as they drink and watch as they drink, those are the ones I want you to take with you. Notice they must have felt special to begin with, even to be invited to be a part of the water test. And all of these men, 9,700 just put their face right down in the water, not paying attention, not being cautious, not being careful about anything that goes on around them. And they just stick their faces like a dog and start lapping the water while only 300 men knelt down and watched and picked up the water and carefully drank it. I tell people all the time, you want to see the true litmus test of people? Watch them when they get in the altar. This way. I see people get in the altar all the time, three services a week. I see people get in the altar. Some of them just go like this, just stand there and look around, just watch people, backing up, getting out of the way. Then you'll see people in the altar. There's these kind of people. They're in the altar. They're praying, God, you got to help me. God, I'm not going to make it if you don't show up. God, you got to touch my family. God, you've got to help me out. God, you've got to give me strength. I want to be around the people that get in this altar and they sit here and they watch and they pray. God, I'm looking for you to move. God, I'm looking for you to do something great as opposed to people. And I don't mean any disrespect, but let me just tell you, if you're going to come to this altar, bring you a sacrifice and lay that thing down and say, God, you have got to move or I'm not going to make it. You can find... You can find the, you can, oh man, I feel the pushback. I feel it. I feel it. You can find the level of seriousness of people in this altar. I'm telling you, saints of God, this ought to be the most serious conversation we have all week long. All year long, this should be the most serious conversation because we're up here praying. You watch people. You see how they respond. I love to see people that get in the altar and just let go and let God have his way. And I don't mean shouting all over because we all have that ability. I mean people that really dig in and say, God, if you don't move, I'm not going to make it. Then we find out that after the subtraction, the subtraction creates strength. Yeah. Oh, it makes no sense, does it? Yeah. It makes no sense for me to say, actually, 300 men are stronger than 32,000 men because it's all about who you have around you. Yeah. Believe it or not, subtraction actually created strength. There are things in your life that are not pushing you, they're dragging you, and they're creating lag for you. Hallelujah. 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 There are people I thought if they ever leave the church, I cannot pastor. When all the time what I should have been saying is, God, if you ever leave the church, I cannot pastor. Thank you, Lord. I'm always reminded that every time you trim down and cut back that apple orchard, and you do it for good reason, and there's a certain time you do it, but the next season, it creates more fruit and a greater harvest because there were things attached to it that actually held it back. And I don't like when God trims on me. I don't like when he pulls things away from me. I don't like when he changes things up. But I always know that all things in Romans 8, 28 work together for good to them that love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Thank you, Lord. 
There'll be times in your life that subtraction adds up. Tell your neighbor it really does add up. I can't tell you the number of times I have encouraged pastors and leaders that when people leave them, it's one thing, but when the presence does, it's worse. There are people, I know this is going to be difficult to swallow, to take in, but I'm telling you there are people, it only takes a family, it only takes one person. You can have 50 people, you can have 500 people, you can have 1,000 people. But I'm telling you, there can be one person that comes in that church that can create such friction for a pastor that instead of looking at 999 people, they stare at the one person that wants to create friction, that wants to gossip, that won't line up with the fight that we have going on, which is not against us, but it's against the Midianites. They have their own side fight going on. They have their own mess going on. I can't tell you how many times I've encouraged pastors. Even as early as last night, I have talked with them and I have told them, you have got to let this thing go. You have got to let it walk away. You have got to let that ball and chain go carry somewhere else. You have got to understand it's best for the church. I no, you don't understand what I might be preaching, but I've been there too many times with leaders and pastors that say it's just this one family that wants to try to run the vision and dominate the house. And I say to them, you got to hang in there. That's when subtraction adds up. That's when I tell them this is when subtraction adds up. Because what will happen is the flow, the ebb and flow, the algorithm of God will begin to hit the place because you understand that I can't do this without God. And there are people that constantly want to kick, little sheep that constantly want to kick everybody's ankle because I'm not happy, I'm burdened, I, I need some oil on my life, I need some presence on my life. And you got to get people like that good and delivered. But some people want to live on drama. Some people love to stir up strife. Some people don't want to get delivered. Some people like to feel bad. Some people love to live in dysfunction. I come by to tell you, get delivered in this house in the name of Jesus. Be free, shout the victory, get some joy back in your life. Come on, everybody, push your neighbor and shout, preach on, young pastor. Man, I know this is tough, and I know it's Christmas time, but I'm giving you an early gift. I'm giving you an early gift. It's called the gift of goodbye. It's your ability to say goodbye to some stuff that's been jacking with your life and jacking with your family and jacking drama up on social media. And every time you turn around, they're never happy. They're always stirring up strife, always stirring up mess. Come on, God. Come on, God. Help me preach what I'm preaching right here. You've seen the videos of one person on an airline that can shut the whole flight down. You've seen it. They're argumentative. They're not going to have their way. The guy has an alternative shirt. I'm a Democrat. They're Republican. I'm not sitting next to them. I've literally seen it happen. Come on, everybody. Isn't the real fight what is best for the world, not what one person's T-shirt says? And it can go either way. It can go either way. Come on, saints of God. We, we literally have a real fight on our hands. There is an enemy of the church. There is an enemy in the atmosphere trying to invade the place, trying to mess everybody up. And if I could get everybody to fight the devil instead of fight one another or fight themselves or fight politics or fight doctrine or fight color or fight churches, or fight who's rich and who's wealthy and who's poor, or fight your differences. Come on, saints. There's a devil on the loose, and we got to be ready. We need some people, even if I just get 300 of you, that'll just step out and say, man, I'm with you. Let's go fight and win this thing for God. Come on. 
Y'all mind if I help myself for a minute? High five a couple of people around you and shout, keep on preaching. The enemy is after the presence and the atmosphere. He's after the fellowship. He wants to try to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to pillage every person of Pentecost. He wants to take every God-fearing believer and pull the ability to fellowship away from them. He wants us to get our eyes off the real fight, and he wants us to get our eyes on everything else. What Gideon was truly looking for was 300 men that could get down by a brook and know how to do what they had to do when it got close to knowing the battle is about to hit. When the 10,000 were there, the battle wasn't so bad because we're still in the process of cutting you down. But when you get to the bare minimum of, of we're getting ready to go to battle, you know that the battle is sitting up on the horizon. You know it's getting closer. And people get flaky when the battle gets near. And people get crazy when the battle intensifies. And that's where you've got to hang in there because you are going through a test right now. Will you run away? Will you operate by the water correctly? And will you be chosen of the 300 to get to the place where we say here's what we're going to do and I need you all to do what I do because if you do what I do God is going to get the credit hallelujah oh man I gotta hurry I gotta hurry I gotta hurry there may be massive amounts of people around us, but there's only some people I can take into some battles. I know you're not going to understand this, and you might not even like it, but I can't take everybody to some battles. There are some people I have to be very selective who I tell things. There are some people that I have to be very selective who I let in on things. There are some people that I can't tell everything because it will stress them out and create fear. I just need to stay here until God keeps working on them and finish it up what God wants to do. But in the meantime, I need to find me some people that know how to get down to the brook. Then I need to find me some people that will carry a trumpet and a pitcher and some fire and God a shout on the inside of them. I need to find me some people that's just as important. That'll be ready to shout the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Where's my shouters at? Woo. Thank you, Lord. Gideon couldn't be stressed about 22,000 people's feelings. Gideon couldn't be stressed about 9,700 people's feelings. What Gideon had to do was concentrate on what he had. God broke him down from 32 to, 20, to, um, to 10,000, so 22 is gone. Then from 10,000, 9,700 walk away. He ends up with 300. Now God doesn't have to do the subtracting anymore. Gideon's getting it now. And what does Gideon do? He splits them up another time, three different ways. Man, I tell you, it's one thing to have 32 and then have 10 and then only have 300. And then you get this feeling, I need to split these guys up again. Let me tell you something, even the 300 that want to go with you where you're going, you might not be able to go with 200 of them, and you may have to send them that way and that way. Not everybody can go where you're going, even when you get the ones that are going where you're going. There's still a group you cannot be in, and get, oh my God, am I preaching all right, anybody? you got to know what group you're in. Y'all ready for this? Yeah. I got one more. I got one more. 32,000, down to 10,000, down to 9,700, down to 300 apiece. Those all left. He's left with 300. And Gideon, not God, Gideon is the one that says, you all go there, you go there, we'll go here. And then Gideon says, God, I'm still not sure. I'm still not sure. Come on, read your Bible. Oh, wait a minute, preacher. I don't read that. Read it. There's a guy in there by the name of P-H-U-R-A-H, Pura. That's him. He's got 300 about to face 
thousands and thousands of warriors. And God says, okay, I'm going to let you take Hura. And you two are going to go down there. And so they take a journey and they look up over the hill and they say, these people are like grasshoppers. There are camels in abundance. These people are everywhere. And God lets them hear what's going on in the camp. Man, this is, this is where it gets good. Because, see, you thought, okay, I can't be with my 300. Okay, I'm going to be with my 100. But when you whittle it down, he could only take one guy. Oh, man, can I preach right here? Can I just preach? There's one man that you need. There's one man that you need. Not 32,000, not 22,000, not 300. There's one man that you're going to need. Can I just inject the fact that his name is Jesus? Through all the people that I have surrounding me at any one given time, I'm glad there's one of the bunch. I'm always glad he's right there. His name is Jesus. Let me tell you, I'm glad that seawalker is there. Let me tell you, that blind eye opener is there. Let me tell you, that crippled made man walker is there. Let me tell you, I'm so glad I got one man. He can go. He can go. He can go. He can handle what I hear. He can handle what I see. He took, he took him. He took him because he knew he can handle this. He was more of like a, a what, what, what we would think of as an armor bearer. One like Jonathan had when Jonathan uh, had to face the Philistines. And, and his armor bearer went with him. So where you go, I'm going. You die, I'm dying. You live, I'm living. Let's do it. Let's do this thing. You got to have someone in your life that absolutely, no matter when they see the multitude, no matter when they see the camels, no matter when they see the livestock, they say, let's go. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to go. Smile at your neighbor and say, it's time to get it. Some of you can't understand why you're broken, why you've lost all your friends. Listen, the 22,000 that walked away, they're still fighting the same battle. I just want to remind everybody, the entire time, there was never another battle. They were all under the same precipice that we've got to fight this enemy. They all, that's the beauty of what's going on here. They didn't start any side clubs. They all said, we've, we've got a battle that we've got to fight. And this is the beauty of how it all happens is they start to recognize we know that God is able to do this. This looks like a massive amount of people and the hillside is covered like grasshoppers. But God spoke to Gideon, divide the three up because there's people that can't handle the angle you're at. Can I preach a minute? You have to know who's around you. The 22,000 couldn't handle even the water test. He had to send them home. I know in my life there are people that I, I, I have learned in my life there are people that I know know how to pray. And I know there are the right people that can get around and hear harsh conversations that can handle it. And then there's people that I can say, I need you to come with me. And I take them over a hillside and we slip up on a big rock and we look over it and I say, come on, look at this. Look at this. And the person I bring to look at what's against us either looks at what we're going to get when this is over or we're going to get killed. The next big thing that God wants you to do, I want you to look at it as if look what God wants to give us, not look what's about to kill me. Hallelujah. Here's the beauty of God. He gives them, he, he gives them, uh, so let me just paraphrase to make this quick and short and sweet. He gives them a trumpet. And he gives them 
uh, a pitcher with uh, a light in it. And so he, they, they're carrying this, and, and, it's, and this is, Gideon says, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to shout when we get to the right place. Do what I do. He told these 300, you got to do what I do. And, and, and that's the thing. That's why 22,000 left because they wouldn't believe God. They wouldn't shout like 300. Let me tell you what, when you only have 300 people and you've got like grasshoppers and camels and everything that you think, oh, I'm going to tell you something. When you know you only have 300, you will yell to the loudest of your ability. You will shout. And let me tell you something. You just won't break. You just won't drop the picture. You will take that thing and break it like a bomb. And he started shouting, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And when they broke those pitchers and shouted like that, God moved upon the enemy. All them grasshoppers, all them camels, you know what they did? Gideon did not even have a sword. He, they, did, they were not going to fight. I need you to do what he does. I need you to shout when he shouts and look what I'm going to do. Because the minute they shouted and the fire went off, the Bible said that those men started killing each other. How long's it been since your trial turned on itself and started fighting amongst itself instead of us fighting amongst ourselves? I believe that God can create such a strong presence that the same light for the children of Israel was darkness to Pharaoh's army. I believe the same God is able to turn stuff around for redemption. I believe the same God is able to turn it around for us. There's some things I've been fighting, I just need to quit fighting it. There's some stuff I need to let go of and I'm going to let go of it. There's some people I just need to say enough's enough. Come on somebody, because they're stunting our growth and they're stunting your growth and they're keeping you held down, busted, broken, disgusted. I dare you to jump up and shout, preach on young pastor. It's just time to let it. Come on somebody, let's give God some praise, come on. How many of you, how many of you know, come on, how many of you know by raising of your hand, I don't tell everybody everything. There's a few of us. The rest of you need to understand, you can't tell everybody everything. They, won't, they either won't understand where you've been or they won't understand where you're going. And both can be as powerful. They don't know where you've been, and they don't know where you're going, and they don't know how to handle you. I know people that can handle me. I know people I can tell just about anything. And then there's some people I know, I got a group of people I can tell them that much, and this group I can tell them this, and this group here, I can tell them all of it. Because they understand me, they know where I came from, they know my heart, they know my intention, they know my motivations. I can't stand up and say everything because people don't know my motivation or my heart. People don't know in my heart, because you know me from a distance. Some people just know me from a distance. Yeah, this guy's the pastor. That's how they know me. Some people, I, I, want, I, I want to hear him preach one of them fiery sermons. I just want to hear the guy sing. Could be lots of things. I just want to see how he interacts with the people. You name it. Thousands of reasons. And people don't know how to handle me if I just said everything. I don't mean flaws in my life. I don't mean mistakes I've made. I mean just my thought process on how I get through things. Sometimes I can have a conversation and God says to me, shut it down. Don't say that. Don't tell that. There's some things I can be talking to people and I get ready to say something and God says, not ready for it. Stop. And I just shut it down and just roll backward and say, enough's enough. Saints of God, we are so close to what God really wants to do. And we are so close to the rapture coming. I don't know why we're so stressed about everything that's going on in the world. Did he not drop off meat by a ravenous bird to the prophet? 
Did he not take a widow of Zarephath and bless her for giving? Did he not take the Hebrew children out of the custody of the Egyptians and Pharaoh? Did he not part the sea and they walked across on dry ground? While when they turned around, Pharaoh's army was swallowed up in the same water and in the same ditch they just came through. Did not he lead them by cloud in the day and fire by night? Did he not give them fresh manna multiple times a day? And they couldn't take enough or it would spoil. God gave them exactly what they needed. Can I keep on preaching that even though there's some stuff being pulled from you, you got to trust God to know that he's going to work it out anyhow. I love this old story. When I was about 19 years old, I was driving a truck. I had intrastate authority, not interstate. I was not allowed to go out of the state, but at 19, they would give me logbooks and tell me to drive to Detroit, Romulus, Ypsilanti, and I've been all over that place, Chicago. And I would run and come back, and I remember one day I was, I was coming off the highway, and I was in Piqua, and coming back from Piqua, there's a rest area over there, and I don't pull into them often. I, I make certain that, that, that I, I, I kind of budget all of my physical extremities and what I have going on, <laughs> trying to make certain that I'm only going to stop at a certain place. But for whatever reason, I got so hungry, and I'm driving down the highway, and I said, God, it would be so good if I had one of them big green apples that I used to sit in the fork of the tree at grandma's house and eat. Oh God, it would be so good. I literally had just said that driving down the road and yes, periodically I will talk to myself. <laughs> and about that time in Piqua, I'm just, you know, 15, 20 minutes from home. And about that time I come up to Piqua and I go into the rest area and I pull the straight truck into the rest area and I just happen to see an old Chevy C10, the two-tone orange and white, white stripe down the side and Kreger wheels on it. And sitting in there is a little beehive hairdo of a precious little look like a Pentecostal woman. Looked like she was ready to go, whoa, anytime. And I pulled up next to her and her son, I could tell, was the one driving Miss Daisy. And I climbed down out of the truck and she got out of the truck and she looked at me and I said well how are you doing she said I'm doing wonderful and we started a little dialogue and about the time here's what she said to me she looked at me and she said we just pulled into this rest area because I told my son that I reminded him that we had a bushel of green apples in the back of this truck would you like to have a green apple oh can't nobody tell me that God is not able. It might not be your apple story, but it's my story. It might not be your pea patch, but it's somebody's pea patch. I dare you to jump up and just push your neighbor and tell him, is God not able? I'm not saying I would have died, but it was good to know that God hears and answers my prayer. Oh, goodness, I feel the Lord in the house. Won't he do it? Come on, won't he do it? Some of you all need to take your hand and wipe that frown right off your face. Some of you need to jump up and say, I'm going to get my joy back today. I'm going to get my peace back today. I'm going to get my deliverance back today. Woo! Everybody take your hand. Everybody take your hand. Put it right on your mouth. Swipe it off. Say there. Just got all that frown off my face. It's got all my sadness off my face. It's got all that mess out of my mouth. Look at your neighbor and say, is my teeth clean? Hallelujah. I'm just telling you that because that's what my wife asks me all the time. She's got the prettiest teeth. I got anything on my teeth, baby? I said, just teeth. <laughs> Come on, saints. Come on, saints. Come on, saints. Come on, saints. We should be better than this. Come on, saints. We should have more joy than this. Come on, saints. We should have more peace than this. Come on, saints. Now we know there's something God has taken out of the way. Now we can rejoice and say, God, I'm trusting you.
God is able. He is my provider. He is my provider. He is my provider. He is my help. He is my comfort. He is my strength. Thank you, Father. Every head bowed across this place. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you, Father, for your power. Thank you, Lord, for your strength. If there's anyone in here today, say, Pastor, I need the Lord in my life. I need, I need strength. I need help. I need God to move. I need God to bless. I need God to save me. I need him to, to give me strength. If there's anyone like that, I want you to raise your hand and say, there's some things I know the Lord wants to cut out. He wants to give me some joy and hope. Raise your hand and say, pray for me. Pray for me. Anyone like that? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Are there others? Are there others? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? If you need Jesus in your life, I want you to come up. I want you to pray and seek God. If you raise your hand, you need Jesus in your life. Come on, come on, come on. Sir, come on, I'll pray with you. Come on, come on, come on, I'll pray with you. Come on, come on. If you need Jesus, come on, come on, come on. I want others to respond right now. I, I got some things, Pastor, that um, I got, I've got some things that, that are kind of moving out of my life and I need God to help me. I'm in transition, I'm in a strange place. I don't like this change. I need God to help me. I want you to come on right now. Come on. Everybody that's standing up, if that's you, come on. Come on. Everybody that can, come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I'm, I'm going to wait. There's, there, should, there, should be, there should be a bunch. There should be a bunch. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. There's more, there's more, there's more, there's more, there's more. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want you to get your peace back. I want you to get your hope back. I push on you because I'm telling you, I feel God speaking in my heart and speaking in my spirit that there's more, there's more. You don't have to be in the place you're in. Come on, come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are there others? 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 Come on, come on. Father God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for grace and mercy. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for redemption. I thank you for restoration. I thank you for peace. I thank you for joy. I thank you for hope. I thank you for the overwhelming power. Thank you for the overwhelming strength. Thank you, God, for the help that we have. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for help, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, touch your people. Touch your people in this altar, God. Bring a peace in their circumstance. Bring peace, peace in their circumstance. Hope in their hearts and lives. Father, do it. Father, do it. Father, do it, God. Father, do it, God. Do it, God. Do it, God. Do it, God. Bless God. Touch God. Touch these young people. Touch these young men. Touch these young women. Touch them. Bless them, help them, encourage them, God. Give them peace, give them peace. Bring healing to them, bring healing to them. Father, I love you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for all that you mean to us. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for joy. I thank you for help. I thank you for peace. I give you all the praise and the credit and all the glory. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody in the church, everybody in the church, lay your hand on somebody's shoulder. I, I know it's tough. I know it's tough to go from 22 to 10 to 300. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. But even through all the setbacks, God still sends somebody with you that it's going to be all right. That it's going to be all right. Lay your hand on somebody's shoulder. Father, I pray for strength right now. I pray for peace right now in people's lives. God, there, there's a lot of change that's going on, Lord, in some families. 
And I pray that you give strength, that you provide help for them, God. Lord, more than anything, that we won't get puffed up over successes that really you get the glory for. And you need to get the praise for it, God. I pray that, Lord, we'll keep our minds and our hearts on you, Lord, loving you and thanking you. We come against sickness and peril. All of those, God, that are sick and afflicted right now that, that cannot be here but are watching from a distance. Father, I pray for your will to be done. I pray for strength, God, to be available to every heart and to every life, God. Move, Father God, we pray. Bless, Father God. Help, Lord. And we give you thanks and praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I want everybody to smile at your neighbor and say, when God subtracts, he adds. There's things that you feel like God needed to remove. I'm not always talking about people. Anything that you feel like could have been a crutch of, of dependency, that when God removes something, that he adds, that he adds. This doesn't mean people you've, you've, you've lost by death. When they're saved, we, we don't lose them. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that complete separate issue. So Father, I thank you for your peace and joy in this house in the name of the Lord. And let everybody shout amen right there. I want you to turn around and hug somebody's neck and tell them you love them in the Lord. And tell them may the peace of God rest upon you in Jesus' name.